We are now live. Hello, folks. Hey, okay, so I watched, as I said earlier, over on Paul Capaldi's when we were live over on Paul's channel. I finished watching the rest of um, how to cover up, uh, what was it called, basically, how to cover up a lab, you know, a lab, whatever. Um, I forget what the actual name of it is here. Hold on a second, folks. Uh, it's... How to fix a drug scandal. That's what it is, right? And so what we're going to be talking about today is this thing here. And and mainly what we're going to also be talking about is how this, how I feel the state's conduct in Massachusetts here ties in with what we see in Manitowoc, maybe even Nina. For those of you following ENC and the $50 million bullet, you know, so this thing is very, very, okay. So there's a lot of, there's, for me, I mean, there's a fair amount to unpack here. So, so, so what, what, what it comes down to is we have, we have basically two lab techs in Massachusetts. One, one of them, hi Sharon. One of them is at the, this, the, the, the Hinton lab, which is in Boston. And then one of them is at the Amherst lab, which is, not in Boston, it's in East, uh, Western Massachusetts, essentially. So it basically, and these are the two main labs there, or whatever. Well, one one lab tech is is at is at Hinton, and that is um, Dukin, lab tech Dukin. Now, the these particular lab techs both were um, both were in the wrong, no doubt. There's no doubt of the fact that these two lab techs were in the wrong. Um, but what, 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 what's important, I think, is the fact that Dukin, the first lab tech that basically got, that started getting called out, what she was doing was, was, I think, a serious problem. And therefore, the cases she handled, I felt, should have been looked at with a bit more scrutiny, scrutiny to begin with. And then we get to the lab tech, uh, I think it's Sonia, but her last name's Farak. And she's the one who was actually getting high in the lab and that sort of stuff. And so we're going to talk about this. So number one, for me, what you have to start out unpacking is number one, Is what these lab techs? How much? How much did these did what these lab techs were doing impact things? Well, to me, fairly significantly. Hi, Audra. Fairly significantly, because with with Dukin, she was taking say about may, anywhere from. 10 to 15 different baggies samples that had come into the lab and she was visually inspecting them just with her eyes. And, and if they all, you know, making sure they all looked like the same thing. Right. And this is how she was saving time. So she would test, she would take 15 or so, you know, 10 to 15 different bags. Right. And then she would just test one. And that one would come up positive for cocaine or for crack or for, heroin or whatever and then you know then she would basically mark that same result down for all the other bags without actually testing them so in that case that that leaves it open for a lot of doubt and for all the people that were convicted by dukin's evidence in my opinion there is some doubt because guess what folks when when somebody gets busted with something fake you know why they're getting busted? It's because it actually looks like the real thing. Because that's when people are trying to sell something fake to somebody. They know it needs to look like the real thing. And so they 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 find ways to make things that look like the real thing. So that's why when she's not testing the other anywhere from 9 to 14 bags that come in, you know, she's, she's, she's leaving that, you know, those, any of those could have been fake, not 
not actually cocaine or not actually heroin, not actually whatever she said it was from the one bag she tested. So there leaves a lot of room for doubt with the convictions based on her results. Now, hello, Linda. Now, when we get to the the other lab tech, Farak, over in Amherst. Now, that's a whole different story here. And I want to make this clear. And I'm, I, I know many people are going to be like, yeah, but she was using drugs in the laboratory. You know, and that sort of thing, right? Yeah, but she wasn't. She wasn't biased. So, like, for instance, Dukin. Dukin had a clear agenda. She was clearly more attached to the prosecution in the state because of her emails. Her emails showed that whenever the state said something, she was all too willing to say. When they said jump, she was all too willing to say how high. Whenever the defense would ask her something in a case, she would constantly check it through the prosecution in the case before she would answer the defense. And it showed she had a clear leaning and a clear, you know, she was clearly favoring the prosecution. And so there she had a clear bias. And so that was another problem with Dukin. Um, and her, me and, and like I said, with her method of only testing one out of say 10 to 15 bags, right. That there leaves a lot of doubt there and a lot of, a lot of, the state itself should have done its own real investigation and scrutiny on it and made sure, right? So, but when we get to Farak, here's my problem. With Farak, I believe her results were probably real and her results were probably proper because guess what, folks? If it wasn't real drugs coming in, she wasn't getting high. You understand, right? Because at one point she couldn't just steal from the the samples in the in the lab anymore, and so she was she was taking drugs, testing them that were coming in, and then taking those and using them herself and replacing it with fake dope. Okay, but the whole point is she was looking for the real stuff and taking the real stuff. So for me, her the convictions under her you know, watch are really kind of less to me. They're, they're, they're less likely to be false because like I say, she was looking for the real stuff. Her, the problem with Farak was much different than the problem with Dukin. And, and so, yeah, but nonetheless, what both of them were doing was wrong completely. And that's not even it. That's not even debatable, really. So, you know, that's unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, that's they, they were both very, very much wrong. But my, the point of me bringing this up is, is how the state of Massachusetts jumped on these things and dealt with them themselves instead of doing what the state of Massachusetts did. If the state of Massachusetts had jumped on them and been more proactive, they wouldn't have been able to minimize. And and they and and I, and I would venture to say that what eventually happened wouldn't have necessarily happened. That mo they would have probably been able to retain most of the convictions, but there might have been several. There might have been quite a few under Dukin, who. If, if, if they went back and tested the samples, they might have come up with fake dope. And I don't believe Dukin was actually getting high. You know what I mean? So I believe her motivations were not... She wasn't putting fake dope back in. So I believe in those cases, they could have gone back and tested it. And, and, it, and it would have been... They could have found out there was people that were finding... You know, they could have gone back and tested it and it would have come back real. And those people's convictions would have been upheld and there might have been some that went back and tested and found that the 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 sample had never actually been tested and it was actually fake right and those those convictions would then be overturned right and that's what could have happened with dukin so this is what the state of massachusetts could have done originally instead what they did was they tried to cover it up hide it and they were basically covering up for everybody and 
Oh, hello, everybody. Sorry, guys. Hello, Rhonda. Hello, Linda. Hello, Audra. Is Ripper still here? Where's he at? Hello, Jamie. So, as I'm saying, the state of Massachusetts could have handled this better. Okay? But instead, it took a couple of defense lawyers who were defending their client who was convicted of a drug charge. And, you know, they ended up taking it all the way, all the way, all the way. You know, they had been lied to by the attorney general's office. And, and that's what this whole show brings home to me is that what the state will do, what the state will do, and how many agencies will fall into line when it comes to saving the state from getting a black eye or from having anything embarrassing. It's amazing to me. And this shows it. It shows, basically, most, multiple agencies casting a blind eye, not reporting the full truth. It shows it. And that's why it's not hard to believe it happened in Manitowoc, Wisconsin. And it's not hard to believe it happened in Nina, Wisconsin. You know? It's just not. And that's what this show to me shows, above all things, is it shows just how committed the state is and just how many agencies will fall into line with it. It's... It's that's what this makes clear. And for me, after watching this, that's what I wanted to point out most of all is that this this shows just how motivated the states are to cover something up rather than deal with it up front. Because what ended up happening is they ended up trying to cover it up and cover it up and cover it up. But those those lawyers, those two particular those lawyers in the ACLU. Ripper, you still here? The ACLU. The ACLU and, and this one defense attorney ended up taking this thing all the way to the highest courts. And they were able to prove, they were able to show that the state had withheld evidence. They had claimed they turned it over, but they had withheld it. They were eventually able to find it because eventually when the prosecution of Sarah Farrak, sorry, it was Sarah Farrak, Eventually, when the prosecution of Sarah Frack was over with, they finally were able to contact the AG's office, and the AG's office actually let them go in and look at the files, these three boxes that were supposedly um, files found in Sarah Frack's trunk. And these files were all based in the fact that she was going to counseling because she was addicted to drugs. And all this stuff basically showed that all the way back to 2004, basically when she got the job, she was addicted to drugs from this file, from this paperwork. So this shows this gross, number one, ineptitude and the fact that the state never noticed all this, all this drugs that Sarah Farrakh was taking that were going missing, particularly the lab samples were like the one bottle that was almost full. But eventually it was down so low, she added water to it and eventually it got thrown away and explained as like it had been sitting there too long. But she had added water to it and the oil and the water had mixed and nobody, nobody figured it out. And she continued, nobody, there was no drug, there was no anything to, 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 to measure what this Sarah Farrakh was able to do. There was nothing there to check and balance it. And that's what's scary in a sense, because... Eventually, when this all goes through and these the lawyers in the ACLU bring this through to the to the end and everything, they get most of the convictions vacated. But I think most of the I, I'm, I don't necessarily think most of the convictions were false. You understand? But because of the misconduct of these two agents, see, that's why the state, if the state had been more proactive, it wouldn't have been that way. The state would have been able to analyze these things and go, okay, no, this person, repeat offender, has been caught with drugs many times. Um, we're pretty sure if we go back and test that sample, it's going to come up as real, real dope, right? And they can, and they can, and they could have approached it in that way. 
and they could have done it in that way without without it having to have gone as far as it did where you know basically a higher court had to order them you know to had to issue this order right they could have done it themselves but didn't they were too busy as somebody else said earlier CYA and that CYA is cover your ass right and that's what that's what the state of Massachusetts was doing they weren't worried about doing what was right and 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 they should have because as I as I started out in this I don't I don't necessarily believe that all of the, all of the results that these technicians came to were wrong I believe with well particularly with Dukin I believe there's a chance for a lot of them there or at least a potentially a fair amount of them that could be wrong just because of how many she wasn't actually testing so I believe that there could be some in there that weren't actually real drugs that the person was trying to make some money but didn't actually have the real stuff, you know, because that happens in the drug world, you know. And so, I mean, these things could have been re these things could have been retested and, and the state of Massachusetts could have done this themselves and 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 brought this under control themselves without it getting bigger. But it got bigger, and 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 a after it was all said and done, this documentary was made to show us exactly how far a state will go to cover up misconduct. It's it's truly amazing, really. Going on here. Hold on a second. Oh, Sheriff Floyd in your hometown. Well, maybe we might have to get around to that at this some point. Well, and, and that's why I'm saying because, you know, when you think about it, folks, how many times do you hear, you know, people making the argument of how can you explain so many agencies involved in the Avery case, all whatever, blah, 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 whatever. Well, number one, I don't believe all of them, I don't believe all of the agencies in the Avery case were planting evidence. Number one. So that's where, that's, that's where the, my number one answer to that. But number two, how can an entire state have been duped? Well, just watch the, uh, how to, how to how to fix a how to fix a, a drug scandal just watch that and you'll see right there just how easy it is for law enforcement and everybody to just fall right into line even though they may even have suspicions that something's not quite right but they'll fall right into line because all compasses point north as i've said many times <laughs> Thanks to my good friend, Mark Audi, who you guys have seen on here previously. Him and I were on recently having a little chat. You guys may remember. So that's, that's something everybody needs to keep in mind. And I think that's the powerful message in this new documentary. Not that I think that these two lab technicians were evil. Not that I think that they were anything like that. But, but this, should, this should also explain to you, everybody, why standard operating procedure is so important. And, and, and this should point out to everybody why, why it is important and, and why it's followed. Because these two ladies didn't follow it. And they were eventually found out. And the state, the state threw them to the wolves thinking that would be the end of it. But the state didn't pursue any further narrative with Farrakh. They just, they let her plea bargain and everything, but didn't ask her to explain anything. They just let her plea bargain down and that was it. It was done. Right? And so everybody was wondering, why isn't there more than that? And, and eventually that's what the higher courts in the state eventually decided was their 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 investigation and, and and everything was inadequate and they needed to do it right and basically the courts put them in the position where they couldn't force the state to do the investigation 
but they were basically making it clear that if the state wasn't willing to do it themselves, that the court would, you know, find a way to get it done, basically, right? So it's interesting. So, so it gets looked into, and but my whole point is is that if the state had done, if the state had gotten proactive and done what the court was telling them, but before the court told them, it would have been a lot different. But it's not. It shows you that they will go all the way until the end, until they get, until they get absolutely found out to where it's beyond all doubt, and then only then will they tuck tail and 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 try to make it right because they're being ordered to. So, trust me, Wisconsin is not going to be any different. They're not going to fess up to what they did wrong. Even though many of them may be looking at the case and going, "Oh God, this thing's a whole train wreck." I, I wish, I, I wish, I wish this wasn't happening, but it is happening. It is happening, and eventually, there's just too much. There's just too much wrong here because, like I was saying about standard operating procedure, folks, these two ladies broke it, and the state was throwing them to the wolves. Because that's what happens when you, as a law enforcement officer or an agent of the state or a prosecutor, or anybody like that who's involved with prosecuting um, criminals and, and, and suspects and, and all those things, right? You are supposed to follow a certain operating procedure for a reason because that that following that operating procedure protects you as a officer of the state or the law or whatever, okay? It protects you. It it it. it, it if you follow those procedures, even if something ends up going awry or something unexpected ends up happening and something tragic ends up happening, most by following standard operating procedure, most most officers, uh, agents and officers, uh, agents of the state and officers basically are protected by the fact that they were following the established rules, right? So that's why it's so very uncommon when you see agents of the state and officers breaking SOP and not following it, because that is something when, when, when agents of the state and when officers break SOP, that is them putting themselves at risk. They are choosing to put themselves at risk. Okay. Because they are they are choosing not to follow standard operating procedure, and that only opens them up to scrutiny. So they have to have a damn good reason for doing it. And in the Avery case, I see a lot of breaking with standard operating procedure, but I see absolutely no good reason for any of it. And that's the honesty in it. The AG, yeah. See, well, that's just the whole thing is that it's just like the AG in Wisconsin. Let's go all the way back to 1985. Let's go back to Peg Lautenschlager, right? Or as Paul likes to say, likes her lager, right? If we go all the way back then, that's the AG of Wisconsin. With everything we know about the 1985 case. And she whitewashed it. Tried to say it was a breakdown in communication. It wasn't that. But then again, Michael Griesbach and Mark Rohrer didn't send her the information about Andy Colburn getting the call from Brown County. So there's so much misconduct going on. You can't even keep track of whose misconduct is whose. And that's in the 85 case. That's before we ever get to talking about Teresa Halbach in 2005. Okay? That's that's the reality of it. And that's why this show, and I encourage everybody to watch it, because I want everybody to be talking about how clearly obvious it is, how, how much of an interest the states have in covering up their own BS. It's another reason why AEDPA is not a good thing. 
It's another reason because it's allowing these states to be this brazen, okay, and to ignore things that are going on, okay? AEDPA is not working effectively. It's either too harsh or needs to be done away with completely because it's allowing states to get away with stuff like this because it's allowing it all to go unchecked by the federal branch. And, and so that's, that's really what I hope people will watch this and see what the states are able to get away with. And when you're asking yourself, why are they able to get away with it? Remember AEDPA. <laughs> I am sorry, folks. There is a, yes, there is a Siberian, there's a Siberian Husky outside uh, who is basically kind of in a bit of a naughty zone and she is not happy about it and she's howling a little bit, but she is perfectly safe and fine and there's nothing wrong with her. She has food and water and a bone to chew on. Um, she's just complaining because she can't go where she wants to go. So I do apologize for that. Anyways. <laughs> Yeah, what like Luke Ryan was doing. Yes, exactly. Zellner is doing that. Zellner is digging up all the truth and going, here's the facts. Here's what here's what here's what somebody who actually looks into this and investigates this properly, this is what comes up. Right? And that's what she's basically saying. And the state hasn't done these things. That's Zellner's main point. And that's essentially what Luke, as she was saying here, Luke um was doing uh, in this case. He the, he was the lawyer along with the ACLU lawyer whose name I'm forgetting, um, and they were, you know, bringing this you know thing and 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 they took it all the way to the highest court there. Uh, and and yeah, it's 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 like I say, it's very very interesting. The the highest court there in Massachusetts, and and eventually, they were able to prove their case, well enough and 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 so much that the judge in the case. I mean, issued a very harsh ruling against the state of Massachusetts. It was, you know, and, and I'm glad. I'm glad that eventually I saw a judge because earlier on in the show, I saw a judge who basically when the defense was telling the judge, look, there's, there's, they're talking about this paperwork. There's this talk about this paperwork that was in the trunk, but we've never received it. We have never received this paperwork. We want it now. We're asking for it now. And that day, the judge then looks at the prosecutor. Her name was Chris. I forget what her last name was. Chris something. And and he's asking her, like, where is it? And she's, like, trying to, like, oh, whatever, whatever. And he gets mad. And he tells her, no, if this is in your possession, you need to, you need to turn it over or whatever. So court ends that day or whatever. She goes back to her offices. The next day. She writes, or she writes a letter to the judge saying, oh, we don't have to provide this because it's already been provided. It had never been provided. In fact, when the lawyers had asked the AG's office for these three boxes that were said to contain all these papers that were in Frack's trunk, they were told, no, they couldn't see it while the prosecution of Frack was still going on. So they were denied. But when that ended, they did finally get in there. The AG's office then at that point did let them in. It was a very tense situation. The lawyer explains it as a very tense situation because they had a marshal sitting just down the aisle as he was looking through these boxes. Wasn't able, wasn't able to like take the boxes over to a little uh, room with a copy machine or anything. It was all very, very, you know, tense. So he was just taking pictures with his phone and trying to act nonchalant and, and found pretty much as much as he could and everything, right? And then that it was through that that they were able to prove their case in the end that the AG's office in Massachusetts, the state of Massachusetts had had swept this under the rug and, and had tried to minimize the damage done essentially by, by Sarah Farrakh. Now, as I've said before, I believe a lot of Sarah Farrakh's convictions would have held up. But the problem is she was, you know, in her later years when she stopped just using the little samples, you know, or the standards in the lab, when she actually started taking the stuff that was coming in and replacing it with fake stuff, 
she was creating a problem there that she couldn't, there was no, there's no way she could defend herself and there's no way the state could defend itself. Those convictions would have to get vacated. But I believe in her early career, you know, she, I believe she was probably pretty on the level. So I don't know. But anyways, that's what's wrong when you don't follow standard operating procedure as these two ladies were found out to be not following and look at all the problem it created, you know? So it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, for me, it's, it's just, because I believe that um, many of the convictions that that were obtained with the with the results from these two technicians could have probably been upheld, ultimately upheld, had the state of Massachusetts been more proactive and done the right thing. But see, I think the states have gotten into an attitude now where they don't they don't even feel inclined to do the right thing anymore because they don't feel like there's anything that anybody can do. They feel like AEDPA shields them from the federal government getting involved. And so they feel like they can get away with murder. And and that's scary. But thanks to, thanks to the ACLU and uh, the lawyer, Luke, I forget his last name. Thanks to them, this, this, ended up, this ended up being a win for the good guys and exposes how far the state is willing to go to cover themselves. I, I, I can't say it enough. So when, so when people ask, how could that be happening here in Wisconsin? It's simple. Okay. They all, they all, they all don't want to rock the boat when it comes to law enforcement community. They all, if, if things are coming up, looking a certain way, they all just go along with that and tend not to ask any questions. Hey, Mill Billy. Yeah, fraud upon the court. Exactly. That's what the court held, and that's why the state was have forced to go back and, and re-examine this stuff. And the judge was basically threatening to, if they didn't do it, he'd figure out a way to get it done himself in a sense. I mean, that was the that was kind of the looming um underlying threat in what the judge in in the judge's decision so so yeah this show was just very very interesting it was it was just to see I, I I just think it pertains to Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey very much and how much a an unscrupulous I mean to get into the even though so let's get into talking about Dukin because what if what if Sherry Colhane is a Dukin? Right? What if those what if Sherry Colhane and Dukin are the similar type of analyst, lab analyst? Because we all understand from watching this that Dukin was very much pro-prosecution. She would, even when the defense asked her about something, she would check with the prosecution before answering the defense. You know what I mean? So that shows a clear inclination that she had. What if Sherry Colhane truly is like Dukin? What if we don't know about it because the state of Wisconsin doesn't care, just like the state of Massachusetts didn't care, and they've never properly checked up? So we don't know. What if? That's what the other part of this that was concerning me when I was when I was watching what was going on with Dukin. And this is the problem with not following standard operating procedure is it creates these questions. And they're questions that people should ask when standard operating procedure isn't followed. It's that's what should happen. And so that's what we've all done in the Avery and Dassey cases because we know standard operating procedure was clearly not followed, but we don't have any clear explanation or understanding of why it wasn't followed. 
It's just for us to accept that it was done and not to question it. And I'm, that's just not acceptable. And so we continue to put that pressure on. The lawyers are using the legal arena to put their pressure on. And we, as the people and the public and the world, as Brendan Dassey and Stephen Avery's supporters do, span the globe, we are putting that public pressure on. We are putting that white hot spotlight on to that small area. And we are waiting for them to step out of line. They can't relax. They can't ease up. They can't go back to life before making a murderer. Because too many people are watching what they're doing. And so they have to, they have to be constantly on guard. And they will eventually get weary. Somebody will eventually get weary. And as I said, somebody will flip or slip. And when I say flip or slip, I mean, number one, somebody will just flip and spill the beans because they don't want to be the one. Maybe they're hoping to avoid the worst of the, the punishment that might come to those involved in the end. Or somebody will slip. They will say something at some point that will get them into trouble. So that's the way I see it. And that's what it's important for Stephen Avery and Brendan Dassey supporters to continue to remember. And when I was watching this thing about, you know, what was going on in Boston and Massachusetts and, and Amherst and, and everything that was going on here in Massachusetts, the whole time I'm sitting there going, this is why. This is proving how an entire state and multiple agencies can just ignore and hide and 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 carry on an agenda and and keep it completely secret i mean and i'm so pissed off at that judge that judge when 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 that when that one um attorney from the ag's office came back and said we uh, or wrote her letter wrote a letter to the judge saying we already turned it all over and he never asked for any proof of that that they had turned it over I mean, I would immediately as a judge been saying, okay, great. If you have, then tell us where so I can review it. Because that's what he was basically telling her. He wanted to review it. And he didn't know about it. But he let it go. That's another problem I noticed in this. The damn judges are not going to do their job. The damn judges are looking the other way. Because when she comes back with that, when he knows she clearly hasn't turned it over at that point, because he's clearly no, realizing he hasn't seen it himself. The judge himself is realizing he hasn't seen it. And, and for her to come back with that answer and he doesn't press the issue at all and finds in favor of the state and basically says that Frack's use of drugs was only six months when it had literally been since... It had been for eight years since she was hired in 2004. Literally since the day she started, she had an addiction. But that judge, because he didn't ask that, he because he didn't push that issue, it took a lot longer for the ACLU lawyer and, and the other guy, Mr. Luke, or Luke, what's his name? I forget his name, the lawyer, other lawyer, for them to end up drawing this all out in the higher courts later. You know what I mean? But I was, I, I, for me, I'm angry that that judge who looked like he was digging in the right place because he realized something was fishy, but then in, just ended up abandoning it and going, ah, yeah, whatever, never mind. It's not important. And covered for the state. This is what I don't. To me, this is like, no, this is a problem. And it's like I said, it's multiple agencies, multiple parts of the criminal justice system that are that are doing this. It's just, to me, sad. Dirty deeds. Yeah, you're probably right, Andrew. Okay, folks. Well, I think I've said all I had to say about this one. I'm sure I'm going to be revisiting this topic about, about how to fix a, a, a drug scandal because 
it's it's like I said, I'm gonna be hammer on this, hammering and hammering on this because this is this is watching what happened in this show is how is how multiple agencies in a state can all kind of click together and come together and back each other up and cover up something that is you know clearly bad. But if they would just deal with it in an upfront manner, it would be a, it, it wouldn't be nearly as bad. If they would take it in hand and deal with it themselves and be honest about it, it would be a lot worse. I mean, a lot. It would be. I'm sorry. It wouldn't be worse. It would be a lot less uh, traumatic for the state. I, I I seriously believe that because I I seriously don't necessarily believe all the convictions, all the convictions that were vacated here. I don't believe all those convictions were vacated because the 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 person wasn't carrying some amount of an illegal substance at the time. I think a lot of the convictions were vacated because the state figured they were too small or whatever to do anything about. And so they just let it go and they focused on the big ones. But had they gotten more proactive at an earlier date, they could have handled it in a way where it would have been a lot different. And, and so it's like I say, it's, it's, it's in watching the states and how they'll avoid dealing with a problem that shows us how what we see happening in Wisconsin can happen. And that is the main thing I wanted to, to let everybody know, to bring home when you're watching this thing, to think about that. Think about the state of Massachusetts conduct and what happened here, you know? And, and, and think about how there was nothing there to check and balance it. Think about how there was nothing there to prevent it. It's all this blind faith because of this current attitude in our culture of tough on crime. How's that working out? It's making more hardened and toughened criminals who are training more other criminals while they're in the while they're inside the prisons and jails and and creating more and more of a criminal stronger criminal community. So how's that working out? Being tougher on crime Is, is is an attitude that I think is outdated. We need to start thinking more progressively because putting people in, in jail for drug crimes because they have an addiction is one thing. But when we put people in places like that, they learn other things. They learn to become thieves. They learn to become uh, addicted to even harsher drugs than, than the one that, that got them in there. There's a number of things that happen. Um, and, and so we need to start focusing more on rehabilitation and, and less on, 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 you know, punishment, so to speak. Now, do I believe anybody that has taken life, you know, should, should, should be out? I don't think so. I think people, if you choose to take a life that you, you kind of basically choose to sacrifice yours if you're found guilty. And I don't mean by death penalty. I mean, you choose, you've chosen to take a life. You've chosen to accept what's going to happen in our society if you do that. But for drug crimes, little things like drug crimes and other little things like where people don't actually get hurt. Now, anything involving actual injury is another story, but crimes involving where nobody actually gets physically hurt and things like that, I think are of a different caliber obviously. And, and the focus should be more on rehabilitation and curbing the behavior that got those people into the, into the situation they were in when they got uh, busted, arrested, however you want to look at it. But, and I know I talk, words are easy, right? Right? Words are easy. I get it. I know. I'm sitting here saying these words, but words are easy, right? I know. I get it, folks. So I, but I figure, what, whatever, I'll just put them out there in the ether. I'll at least say it out loud, right? Um, but that's kind of where we need to be. We need to be thinking more about that sort of stuff because the system needs to have a slightly different approach than it has. It's all doom and gloom. The approach is doom and gloom, and it produces false confessions quite a, quite a few, quite a few, 
quite a great many of false confessions. <coughs> Sorry. But it produces quite a few false confessions and coarse confessions. And it's it's because it's so doom and gloom, in my opinion. We need to focus more on rehabilitation um, with smaller crimes, particularly with drug offenses and, and small crimes where nobody is actually hurt or physically damaged or hurt or injured. Now, I, I just, you know, obviously when it comes to things like the taking of a life, well, I have a little bit different feeling about that, but I believe the death penalty is ultimately self-defeating, honestly, because what if you get it wrong? I mean, we're not perfect. We we can only we we only have to look at the data coming out of the innocence projects to realize we're not perfect. Our justice system doesn't get it right every time. That's what we that's we that is clearly empirical data that's coming out and proving to us we're not perfect. So should we be taking that into our own hands? If we can't give it back, should we be taking it? I, you know, for me, that's, I guess, but we can get into a philosophical discussion about that, right? Anyways, so, but those are my thoughts for today. What's Travis saying? Actually, it wasn't a cough. It was something was, something was, um, when I was talking, wind was rustling across something. It was, anyway, never mind. It wasn't a cough, but that's fine. I'm fine, folks. So, uh, anyways, um, but so that's, that's, that's where we're at. So, yeah, I'm fine. So, anyway, that's where we're at, folks. I, if, if you guys haven't watched, how to cover up a lab, uh, how to, or, you know, how to, how to fix a lab or how to fix a drug scandal. Sorry. How to fix a drug scandal. Go over and watch that. And like I said, if you want to understand how, how a state and multiple agencies and multiple, you know, people in, in the, in the AG's office can work together to keep something under wraps. That's what this show shows you. It shows you that in spades. And if you and if and, and and if you if you if anybody doubts how that could be happening in Wisconsin, this is something that will point it out very clearly, and 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 show that it is very much possible. So, and 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 that's that's basically what I wanted to say today. So I am going to go ahead and deal with this pup who is losing her mind um, outside, guys. Uh, I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover. Um, because I know everybody's worried about that one semi cough I just had about two minutes ago, but I'm more worried about the puppy outside who's clearly seeming to get into more and more distress the more she's by herself. So I'm going to go and say hi to the pup. I think I've said all I had to say. Uh, so anyways, as I uh, always say, if you haven't already, please hit subscribe and we'll see you.